Hey there guys and welcome to Kick Scammers, the show where we look at all of the terrible, scammy, unbelievable and downright crazy Kickstarters, Indiegogos and GoFundMes to ever grace the world of crowdfunding. Over the years I've covered well over 200 campaigns whilst working on this show and whilst I work on some rather insane episodes in the background that are taking a little longer than expected, I've decided to collect together five of the um, best or worst if you prefer in Now That's What I Call Kick Scammers Volume 1. The top five weirdest people behind the Kickstarters, Indiegogos and GoFundMes that I have ever ever covered. I wanna take are these scams or are they just misunderstood? The people behind each of these five campaigns, I'm sure, didn't mean to confuse, but confuse they did. So let's not hang about, let's get right into it, into the top five weirdest campaigns ever. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. This rather clever fellow is Bobby Ray Simmons Jr, better known by his stage name B.O.B. Yes, that moderately successful rapper who had such hit singles as Nothing On You featuring the incredible Bruno Mars and of course Airplanes featuring the amazing Hayley Williams. <laughs> yes, that's me. Not many big hits happened for poor old B.O.B after these worldwide smashes mind you and let's be honest hearing about them? Well, that's not why you're here. Nope. And thankfully for you guys, when Bobby's not creating global smash hits about aeroplanes, he's on a mission to prove that the Earth is flat. Yep, the global superstar, <laughs> I repeat, the global superstar actually believes that when he's touring the world, he's doing it on a flat surface with NASA agents at the edge stopping people falling off. So what does this have to do with Kickstarter? Nothing, because this time we're going to be going back to GoFundMe. For only $200,000, Mr. Simmons here will prove that the Earth is flat with um, satellites, weather balloons and drones and stuff. What's up y'all, it's Flat Earth Bob here. I'm starting this GoFundMe because I would like to send one, if not multiple, satellites as far into space as I can, or into orbit as I can, to find the curve. I'm, I really, I'm looking for the curve. That was before he realized that $200,000, oh, it just wasn't enough. And he changed that end goal to a nice round million. <laughs> or should I say, flat million, <laughs> hey? If you are not following B.O.B. on your social media of choice, then perhaps now is the time to do so. The reason I say this is that B.O.B. often tweets out some rather interesting things. You can find him arguing about his flat earth theory, you got moon landing theories, celebrity cloning and plenty of other whack job opinions. In other words, if a conspiracy theory exists, Bob probably believes it. And sadly for him, those outlandish beliefs have actually oozed into the rapper's releases. Whereas other bad boy MCs have beef with rival gangs resulting in drive-bys and the occasional mother cussing, B.O.B. ain't got no time for that whack fake news and instead he created the song Flatline which was his way of dissing the psychiatrist Neil deGrasse Tyson, who just so happens to be the scientist that tried to explain to B.O.B. that the world isn't flat, right in front of B.O.B.'s worldwide homies on Twitter. But that's not all he raps about, you got the holocaust denial, mirror lizards, freemasons, indoctrinating young people and best of all, how science is actually a cult. So where does this leave Flat Earth Bob's GoFundMe page? Well, it leaves it far, 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 far from its $1 million goal. However, it does surprise me that 229 people actually believe in the experiment. But hey, they actually do. So um, will Bobby ever hit his goal? 
<laughs> no, of course he won't. Well, not without a wish right now. 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 Conspiracy theorists, am I right? I mean, we shouldn't really mock guys. I'm sure plenty of people that watch this particular show are conspiracy theorists. For me, I always find it fascinating understanding why and how people get to a stage where this kind of thing becomes fact. And thankfully, Conspiracies and Conspiracy Theories by Michael Shermer should help us understand these kind of people that believe these theories a little bit more. <sighs> Thanks to today's sponsor. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Audible is sponsoring this one. Go on, go check out audiobooks like this one completely for free by going to audible.com forward slash SGR or texting SGR to 500 500 completely for free. Plus, you get a 30 day free trial on top of that. In fact, I highly suggest checking out the entire catalogue of the Great Courses series. You're going to find some insanely interesting stuff here, like medieval myths and mysteries, medieval mysteries across history, and like I previously mentioned, a history of video games. I couldn't even possibly start to go through all of the different types of audiobooks on this website because there are literally thousands upon thousands, and on top of that, original podcasts to choose from at Audible, the leading provider of spoken word entertainment where as a regular member yourself you will be able to get the ability to check out a brand new title every single month. Whatever you're interested in, Audible has you covered. So again, go to audible.com forward slash SGR or text SGR to 500 500 completely for free with a 30 day free trial on top of that. Sometimes when creating these kick scammer videos, you hit some pretty big walls. Some of you may remember about a month ago when I streamed my very first ever kick scammer live episode. I was offered a rather awesome suggestion in my Discord, link below if you want to join, taking me to a couple of campaigns from the same guy, Anthony Brown. At first, it seemed mildly humorous, but when digging deeper into these two campaigns, a whole heap of mess opened itself up, and Andrew Dalton and I, my Steam buddy, knew that this was most definitely going to make it into a future video. A big thanks to Grimm for these rather odd suggestions. Now... The big walls I was talking about. Turns out that not long after the stream, I can't be exactly sure when, one of the campaigns completely vanished. The YouTube account hosting the videos for the campaigns have been deleted, and the website hosting the rather bizarre sexual content has also been wiped. Was it because of this? Who knows? All I know is that Anthony Brown did a bloody good job of hiding. Thankfully for me, however, I have a kick scammer army that helped me when things like this happen. So, before going into all the detail of what we was and wasn't able to recover, let's look at the two campaigns, starting with the only one that is still active. D-Machine, Real Time Machine. The world's first time machine ever built will be coming soon to the public. Bloody hell, that's impressive, right? And at the time of making this video, it's still currently funding. Asking for $100,000, which sadly has not been hit, as zero backers have slapped down zero dollars. So, how was Anthony going to make this time machine? Well, it's technically still in the concept stage. Obviously, it's just an idea. But before you start dismissing, if you go to his website, you can see a very solid diagram of the device. Right. D-Machines allow you to travel to other worlds without dying. Training has to be done before using these machines because of the threat of entities and mimic worlds that reflect our own. D-Machines are real virtual reality technology that can prove any facts about time and dimension travel like no other machine or device can in the world. These are real-time machines and should be used very carefully. 
This is going to be a bit of a theme for this segment, guys. Plenty of ideas that are so far out there and simply nothing more than a simple design idea created in Microsoft Paint. It's a bizarre segment and for me just goes to show that anyone can create an Indiegogo campaign with practically no ramifications at all. The second Indiegogo campaign, like I said, has been removed. And surprisingly, I can't even find it in the Indiegogo app, which, in case you didn't know, is a great way of opening up previously removed campaigns that can't be found on a desktop PC. In case you was wondering, that's how I was able to find out about 9-11 Redux. Now with this segment gone, obviously I still have my Kickscammer live video showing off the flying quad rotor car. Another very random campaign from Anthony who has taken his MS Paint skills to the next level. Sadly the YouTube page has gone missing showing off the video, but Anthony forgot to delete his Vimeo account that for some reason has the exact same video 56 times. And here it is. Oh, it's just a picture. Okay, never mind. So yeah, this one never got any backers either. But what's easily the most interesting part of this whole segment is the description, which has a link to Anthony's website. This is where it gets really, really strange. Not only can you fund his idea via Indiegogo, but you can also do it right here too on PayPal and Bitcoin and various other ways. Do you want a mech suit? Anthony's got you covered. Android robots? Underground structures? Advanced civil engineering plans? Hover bikes and advanced clothing? Now, not all of this is even at the early MS Paint stages yet. But hey, it's the thought that counts, right? And whilst on that subject, I bet you're thinking to yourself, what the hell has this all got to do with bloody erotica? Well, this is where Anthony took one final step in covering his trail. Again, we got the original stream as a reference, which is good, but not great. And sadly, the Wayback Machine has let me down in this instance. But, thankfully, Andrew in Discord came to the rescue and using Google Cash, managed to bring back to life Anthony's most detailed and impressive crowdfunder. Sex Robots Triple X. Yep, these female type androids are coming and are fully tailored to your specifications, including Sex doll, robot silicon, rubber flesh with water and artificial blood underlay. Heater core heart that warms the water to 90 degrees. Underlay gelatine parts, artificial tongue and throat. Artificial vagina with heated lub system that's flushable. Artificial nose and mouth breathing system that simulates breath. Perpetual eye blink system when faces touch pressure points pump the eyelids close. Pump to moan system. 720p eyeball systems. Internal computer. Ethernet link quad USB port. Dual microphone ears. Remote IP system. Voice speaker system. 5000 skin poor system. So, why did Anthony feel the need to hide this section of the website? Is it because building female androids can't be done in this day and age with all the specific specs which you can see on the screen right here, compared to stuff like time machines and hover bikes? Or was it the opposite? Perhaps Anthony has built one of these things and it's showing him the time of his life. Whatever the reason, I think we can all take something away from Anthony and his D7 organization website. And no, it's not the fact that you can never hide from the kick scammer crew. <laughs> but instead, it's a message of hope and encouragement. Sure, these may all seem like simple MS paint drawings now, but maybe, just maybe, we will be living in Anthony's future with a perfectly customizable sex robot. So to win this video, I would like to get Nostalgia Nerd to read you the D7 Organizational Oath, which can be found on the drop-down tab of the website, playing alongside the highly motivational SIDS theme from Final Fantasy VII, which just so happens to automatically play when you're on this page. 
Man and woman were created and was born to work, but work for their own luxuries and needs, create their own worlds and be their own kings and quens. No one is meant to be a slave and we all fight amongst each other under hate for love. Not one soul is equal in this world because we are all different spirits and if we are alive then we are already dead. This world is only a dream and we all are connected spirits in this dream. There is no difference between a dream and reality. Anything can be created, shaped and formed and this world is bigger than you think. Don't let your dreams fail you and don't let the Archons feed off your energy. Rise up, take action and never back down, neither in this world or any other. Good God, Dan, what is this crap you're making me read? Never heard anything like it. Who wants a new console? Don't worry, I'm not talking about that. Or that. Nope, today we are looking at the Cyber Matrix 100 TU01. What you are looking at here is a promo video on the page that did get funded by 29 backers pledging $504 of a $500 target. The promo video is about 8 minutes long and after watching it I have no concrete idea what is actually being sold here. Something about two devices that give you the ability to make games, movies and music inside a cyberspace matrix, whatever that is. Now just like the classic potato salad kickstarter, there is actually no physical reward for the backers. In fact the only tier is $10. For this amount I will say thank you in December 2019. There is some mock up images of what will be made including some weird Triforce adapter in what I think is the back of the unit and in the risks and challenges section you have nothing special. In the updates before the console of the future was funded he wrote Dear backers and everyone I want to let you all know that those who pledge a lot of money Please don't, as I need it to build my Cyber Matrix 100. For those that pledge a little, keep hitting. I'll get it somehow. The console of the future has to succeed. No more failures. I have to succeed. Sure. Before replying to his own post with, Please don't retract your funds, as I need it to build the Cyber Matrix 100. Now, obviously nothing much has happened here, except for this being one of seven projects. Five of which are just this project again, and another two being books about fish. This story begins when Pascaya Sikono enters a heated battle with Lord Shinayo Johnson and attempts to re-steal a special ancient laptop left by Jehovah Christ. Pascaya kills hostile leaders as he waits for the laptop to arrive after the fall. Now I'm not here to point fingers and laugh at someone that is most likely mentally unstable. But what I will say is out of those seven projects that this guy has put forward, not one of them was cancelled by Kickstarter. I mean heck, who knows, in 2019 we may be getting the cyber console of the future. But I personally have my doubts. If anyone has any answers on how to make my cyber matrix and to promote my project, let me know. I also need help on how to build my cyber matrix. Do I need soldering tools? Can I use hot glue? Or maybe even Lego? For me, this just goes to show the process in place for creating a Kickstarter is very much open doors for anyone, regardless as to whether or not they actually have the ability to go ahead and complete it. But then again, I have a hunch that the backers for this particular project knew exactly what they was getting themselves into. I'm going to make an animal cross-dating sim. I'm not a furry, I just really like animals in that way, you know?
Catalica is a board game for one to four players that focuses on what it feels like to live as a member of the stellar consciousness of the galaxy. Um, okay. Even though games like this are not really my cup of tea, I see stuff like this all the time in board game shops and it obviously has quite a big fan base. And regardless of my board game taste, you can't deny that the game looks absolutely stunning. Sadly, the campaign didn't have a video, a bit of a Kickstarter sin if you ask me. But it was still able to reach its humble goal of $7,500 when 85 backers put in a combined total of $7,840. You had backers pledging $35 for the prototype, $50 for the entry level game, $70 to get loads of Kickstarter exclusives and of course, several other tiers leading up to $200 for varnished box versions and retail combo packs. All in all, not that bad. And on August the 19th, 2011, the campaign ended with backers and creators happy as Larry. Hello you. Updates at first were quite frequent, short but sweet, mini updates talking about playtesting and computer layouts, and then on September the 22nd she gave another update saying that the game was in fact ahead of schedule. And then the updates started to slow down a little. But backers were okay, good old Molly did explain herself and from my own personal experience, these things happen from time to time. After a couple more updates on June the 4th, 2012, after building up the hopes of all backers with positive playtestings and constant artwork examples, we got this. Update. Ever since about December, I've been harassed by a voice that is claiming to be the sun, and it's been attacking me and harassing me almost every hour of the day. Yep. The first and probably last time ever on Kick Scammers that a project didn't fail because it ran out of money or the creator ran away with your money. <laughs> oh no, no, no. The reason this game sort of failed is because of that bastard up there. The voice said that The Sun didn't want you to publish Catalica because it wants to be almost exactly like Catalica, but it kept it all a secret. If you publish your game, it's going to let people in on too many secrets. Paraphrasing, of course. My response, the giant glowing mass of hydrogen that lights up our entire planet with heat and colour wants to remain a secret. Seems a bit like a pipe dream for me. Besides, there have already been a few different galactic themed video games and at least one other board game that have all gotten rather popular. So I really don't understand why the sun is supposedly obsessing over the details in this game specifically. The voice won't tell me what it is that I'm supposed to change or remove because apparently that would give too much away. This is all rather strange to me and hard to believe. I could go on and on with this. Obviously Molly has a mental illness and let's be honest, if something as big as the bloody sun was telling you not to release a board game and for whatever reason you believed it, then you're probably not going to do it, are you? Now, you have gotta give respect to the board game community. After such a um, questionable update as this, not one of her backers retaliated in a nasty way. But instead, the comment section is actually full of people trying to not only help complete the game, but also give advice on Molly's mental state. And it was thanks to this that the bloody sun started to ease off, and updates related to the board game began again. And then, on January the 19th, 2013, we got another update that was even more bizarre than the last one. The spiritual side of this has been calming down a lot in the last month or two, as we've been working through some of the more complex details behind the spiritual plasma attacks that have been trying to destroy me since 2008. For anyone that is concerned about the game, the game is finished. The supplies are 95% bore, it's all in climate control storage, and I'm just waiting for the opportunity to print up the cards, which is something I couldn't do because of the harassment. Basically, the US Navy have been putting up transmitter systems all over the place to control the plasma transition, so that I can try to use information as a weapon. Apparently I recorded some things in my game that were a reference to Navy weapons without knowing that, and so I became one of their targets. Ah, oh, come on! First the Sun and now the US Navy? 
Again, the comment section were quite nice to poor old Molly, suggesting that she should get professional help. Sadly though, it didn't look like she was gonna get any. Molly became homeless, her bike trailer was apparently stolen, her intersexual lifestyle was causing quite a bit of a stir, not only in the various religious communities, but also weirdly enough, items made of iron. So she decided to move 2,000 miles away to set her life in order once again. Molly ended up moving into a disabled housing apartment due to a vehicle accident that she had 10 years ago in 2003 and eventually started to get everything up and running again to eventually get that game shipped. July 29th, 2015 was the final update. Apparently there was an issue with the postage and it's costing Molly quite a bit more to get each one sent out. However, at least some of those 85 did in fact get their board games from what I can tell. Sadly though, not all of them. Eric over on Board Game Geek was one of the um, lucky ones and after looking at his posts, he went into detail about his Catalica experience and it was a mixed bag. I admit we did not finish the game. I also admit neither of us quite knew how to finish it. The rulebook is not as helpful as one would hope. We puzzled through things as we went along, making rule decisions as we went along, altering those decisions as conflicts occurred and genuinely had a very good time. If anyone has the opportunity and desire to try this game out, make sure you go into it with a great sense of whimsy. Catalica has since become quite the infamous game. Very few complete copies actually exist and plenty of people want to try it out. Sadly, Molly has gone completely mute and although I do hold hope that all of those 85 backers will get their game, at this point, several years later, I doubt it. Think what you want of Molly and I'm sure there will be plenty of varied opinions in the comments but in my opinion, she never set out to be a scammer, and although her DeviantArt page which featured not only a print and play copy of the game and probably more interestingly a journal of her experiences with the Sun and US Navy has now sadly been deleted, I do feel sorry for her. Hopefully she raises the funds to send out the remaining board games. Hopefully her second project called Eternal War of the Candy Realms, which by the way was going to be given for free to every one of her backers, also gets released. But most of all, hopefully she gets the help she needs. Spoiler alert, she doesn't. After finding her Facebook page, I can't even explain what Molly is going on about in her one-way arguments about the sun, plant life, UV rays, gender trials and skin colour dominance. So I decided to reach out and I got a response. In a nutshell, there's way too much to show you guys here in this video. So if you want to see the full unedited conversation between me and Molly, go check the link in the description. Basically, she goes on to explain that the game was finished, she got sent out to a few backers, as we already know, and she was overall very happy with the game, but does see flaws with the design. Something she could have done better, and she's taken what she's learned from that game to work on that other game I previously mentioned, Eternal War of the Candy Realms. However, she said she's not going to kickstart it as she felt too attacked and harassed by racist and sexist blacks who apparently can't handle a woman with opinions and ideas. This is a common theme between mine and Molly's conversation. Other than explaining that she can't afford to send out any more of the games to the rest of her backers due to her living on a wage that's under the poverty line, the rest of the conversation gets incredibly weird. It was just an endless stream of people who didn't even buy the game attacking me and harassing me. For what? Want inequality as a female by refusing to cut my dick off? I believe gender is fucked up and I refuse to... I'm talking over this because... Well, like I said, you can read this conversation between us in the comments. But basically, all you need to know is at the end of our little conversation that was basically going round and round in circles, I asked, Molly, I think it's best we end it here. I really hope you get the help you need and I wish you all the best. Is there anything you would like to say to your backers or viewers of my video? In which I got no response. Sorry backers of Catalica, at this point it doesn't look like you're gonna get your game.
I am sure that every person sitting watching this has thought the exact same thing at some point in their life. Wouldn't it be great if they, whoever they are, would make the game of your dreams? For me, I always wanted the classic Sonic games back, and well, that sort of happened with games like Sonic Mania and before that, I suppose to a degree, something like Freedom Planet. Two awesome games that, well, to be fair, are not exactly what I wanted. But. I mean, come on, seriously. Surely they're not going to be exactly what I want. Heck, even Streets of Rage 4, even though I'm obviously going to love it, is not going to be exactly what I want. Nothing ever will, because just like all of you watching, the ideas inside your mind are exclusive to you. Most of us just wait for the game to basically never ever come out. And others, like Robert Poloni here, go out of their way to create that perfect game. Robert was a hardcore fan of the Super Nintendo, and his perfect game took inspiration from such titles as Super Metroid and eventually things like Mario 64. But he also took inspiration from things like Dance Dance Revolution, Beat Mania, Super Monkey Ball, Cave Story, and most notably, Earthbound. Yes, all of these games are great, but I'm sure you're all thinking to yourselves, how the hell do they link together? Well, back in the early 2000s, Robert, with almost no game design knowledge behind him, started working on that exact game. It was his 11th school year teacher, one, oh, what did you say here, Conrad Dreskzer, who was the real inspiration for Robert, as he apparently turned something so plain and boring as teaching C++, as he puts it, into a fun-filled lesson full of humour and dry wit, which really did resonate with the class. And of course, Robert in particular. As part of their final assignment, Robert's teacher gave the class a free form assignment to create whatever they wanted. And as Robert had worked out how to switch to a DOS graphics mode, he decided to create something a tad more advanced than the rest of the class. The beginnings of his very own video game. It wasn't anything too spectacular, just you know, a simple room where you could move a character around by simply clicking where you wanted him or her to go. But when the teacher asked, did you really make this? Without any hesitation, Robert replied, of course I did. Understandably, they were both very proud of what he was able to achieve, and shortly after, Robert remembers going to a restaurant with a few like-minded friends when the obvious conversation of video games came up. Robert spoke about his dream game set in the suburbs, cause you know, who could honestly relate to anything like this, and the rest of the meal turned into a napkin scribbling mess of game ideas that everyone else just, you know, left behind when the meal was over. But Robert didn't. He went home and by using what he'd learned in those lessons, he went ahead and started to create Bob's game. Five years and 15,000 hours later, we got this. This was the first trailer originally shown in August of 2008. I had read in several interviews with Robert that since 2003 to now, he was obsessed with creating this game. Eventually, I just got so obsessed with the project that I got used to the idea of all or nothing and began taking my productivity almost too seriously. Most of 2006 and 2007, I was completely isolated, creating assets and generally going bonkers. I can't really recommend this practice, but it certainly wasn't a healthy or pleasant experience. But I think the creativity that came out of this time is the most interesting, and it's inevitably what I'm the most proud and protective of and protective of it, he was. After the trailer became popular very quickly hitting 100,000 views, which was quite the achievement back then when YouTube looked like an old Yahoo search engine, several small companies came to offer their services to help finish the game, but Robert wanted complete creative control and constantly turned all 12 of them down. I'm absolutely thrilled by the response I'm receiving. The past half decade has been quite stressful for me, filled with moments of hopelessness and uncertainty to say the least. The time from 19 to 24 for an introverted geeky male is difficult enough on its own right, and I had more than my share of nights spent wondering what the heck I'm doing. I'm going to wait for a publisher that will let me have complete creative control over the project. 
since I don't want anything changed. He went on to say that the graphics and sound assets were all completely finished and the game's development was currently at about 90%, but the project wouldn't be finished until Nintendo, or as he said, a publisher who lets him have full creative rights, would give him the needed Nintendo development tools to port what he had made to the Nintendo DS, his platform of choice. Everything was going swimmingly for Robert, constantly getting interviewed by so many different articles from all over the world regarding his truly special game. His old website that really is only now viewable via the Wayback Machine shows a constantly updated blog showcasing all of these awesome achievements as well as regularly updating readers on the gaming success of his gameplay trailer. Everyone wanted to know Robert. Everyone except for Nintendo. It's all been peachy and rosy up to this point, guys, but now, commenters, get your timestamp ready. It's about to get pretty weird up in here. It's been exactly four months since I've introduced Bob's game to the world. I'm not dead. The Bob's game development team, me, has moved to a new top-secret classified underground fortress. This was the first time, from what I can tell, that really did show off Ben in a different light. Sure, he added a few more articles, including one from IGN, which was quite impressive, but what the hell is this underground fortress thing about? Well, only four days later, on the 12th of December 2008, we found out with the protest. 100 day Tensai sit down protest start. About 16 weeks of waiting, Robert just couldn't wait no more. He put himself into self-solitary confinement, a 100-day protest against Nintendo, the heartless corporation that only cared about the profits. These are his words, by the way, and not mine, and he put himself, as he describes, into the Viridium Room, which is actually a reference to one of the more well-known virtual escape room games. The door is locked and barricaded from the outside. I am sleeping behind the camera, and yes, I've got a shower. Food is delivered once a week by a friend. I have no internet access, television, or game consoles besides those I am developing on. I can receive and send email on my Android G1, so I can get Nintendo's reply and update my site with Tether. The lengthy post goes on to explain that all he needs is the development tools to finish the game for the Nintendo DS. It will cost Nintendo nothing. He just wants to finish the game and no stubborn intern or mid-level marketing exec at Nintendo of America, who he believes must be deleting all of his emails, are going to stop him. He wanted to hear it from the top and he did this by plastering in big letters above his head on one of those LED signage things, the word Reggie. I'm beginning to think someone at Nintendo is insanely jealous they didn't think of it first and wants to keep me from releasing Bob's game. I've got my eye on that Reggie guy. He's suspicious for sure. I heard he beats people up and writes down their names or something. I'm on to you, Reggie. And in case you didn't get that joke, he is of course talking about this clip. My name is Reggie. I'm about kicking ass. I'm about taking names. And we're about making games. Personally, I can see where he's coming from. Nintendo told him it would only take six weeks to get back to him before pushing him over to the marketing team, and then they pushed him back to the WarioWare team, and then back to the marketing team, but basically just messing him around. And after about 16 weeks of waiting, you know, I would be wound up too. But seriously, even though I know the outcome of this story, this isn't the way to go about doing this, Robert, and this definitely isn't the way to get Nintendo's attention. Or is it? Christmas Day hits with a single line of text. Merry Christmas, Reggie. Robert gives a little more information into his dealings with another Nintendo employee, one Tom Prater, the Senior Director of Project Development at Nintendo of America. It was basically another stab at the company explaining how Mr. Prada was initially postponing the eventual meeting and not really bothering to look at his game when that meeting eventually took place. He advised me to apply for a developer license and assured me that he would do what he could to make sure my application was fast-tracked. Why is my application being mysteriously stalled, Mr. Prada? 
I am publicly begging a Japanese company with a Japanese style of protest to sell me what I require and meet requirements for. To legitimately publish my game in a way that costs them nothing, puts them at no risk, and makes them licensing money. As I've said from the very beginning, my goal is to release a cartridge form of Bob's game for the DS and DSi platforms. The post continues to explain how he plans to release the game physically for DS homebrew devices claiming that it will be the first ever true killer app and it will significantly cut into Nintendo's bottom line. He then describes how much he loves Nintendo and feels bad that he is going to release such a hugely successful product that has potential to harm them. But they have left him no choice. He then goes on to explain how a few Japanese gaming sites have started to document the protest now too. In other words, because of what may be the decision of a single NOA executive, Nintendo of Japan may now be at risk of some very serious consequences. Rob goes on to explain in greater detail about how great his game is and how it would be perfect for a full retail release. After all, it was never intended to be a homebrew app and he doesn't agree with it becoming that, as most people with homebrew devices are using them to run commercial software which are damaging to developers like himself. Although I don't really get how it's damaging him, but yeah, okay, whatever, whatever. How can I say this to make them understand? The game is tremendously good, it's extraordinary, it might sell a million copies. I've barely shown anything at all for a reason. I'm not going to spoil it to prove it to you. You will find out when it's released. I am telling the truth, it's great. Are you honestly going to force me to release it for flashcards? Are you insane? The game is absolutely fantastic. Happy New Year, Reggie. The very next day, he posts again with more ramblings about how important his game is and goes into more detail about how hardcore of a Nintendo fan he truly is. I've played imports in Japanese without being able to read them. I'm still patiently waiting for Super Mario 64 2, Mario 128, and Earthbound 64. Not Mother 3 for GBA, it's not the same. I've never played Final Fantasy 7 because I'm still waiting for its release on Ultra 64. Yeah, I know, it won't. Again, the next day, more ramblings, but this time he blogs about his opinion as to why Nintendo are releasing the then new Nintendo DSi, which is essentially the same console, but with a few extra features. That is before he suggests that Bob's game should actually be a launch title for that system. You may have noticed that up to this point, Rob has started to become more and more delusional as his protest continues against Nintendo. And on this day, he confirms that a homebrew device manufacturer has actually contacted him and offered a solution that would involve releasing the game on a micro SD card along with the relevant DSi enabled homebrew device for far less than the price of a high budget DS title. On top of this, the unknown company can secure retail distribution deals with Walmart and other stores like GameStop. If this was true, it does seem like a pretty cool exclusive way to put out a game that was becoming increasingly legendary amongst internet goers. But Rob didn't want this, and he just continued to explain why he feels the game is worthy of a full release and continued to protest against Nintendo. Nintendo, you cannot keep ignoring me. There is nobody like me, I have created the entire game start to finish. I am far better than Miyamoto, Itoi, Kojima, Carmack, and Wright combined. None of these designers could create the entire thing if their lives depended on it. They rely on the assistance of others and take all the credit. They don't even deserve their titles. I have bested them by far. The anger towards Nintendo begins to get out of hand, and in today's post, as Rob continues to fall further down the rabbit hole of insanity, he wrote, Those who doubt me, you will be proven wrong. In time, the truth will prevail. Prepare to eat your words. Yes, I am completely serious. Who's taking names now, Reggie? Oh man, did I really write that? That's not like me. I can't even remember. My head hurts. 73 more days. I can do it. I'm fine. I'll be fine. I need that SDK. Please, Nintendo. I'm begging you. These ramblings continue into the very next day. I sincerely apologize to all Nintendo staff and all Bob's Games fans. I don't know what's come over me lately. I would never try to damage you, Nintendo. I'm a huge fan. I'm trying really hard here. I believe in you, Nintendo. You know how hard this is on me, right? 
It's practically torture. What else can I do, Nintendo? You won't ignore my protest. I know you won't. Your company must hear my pleas. A young hero trying his best, like Mario or Link, won't be abandoned and tossed aside, will he? A kind-hearted company like Nintendo would never ignore the pleas of a distressed young talent. I have faith in you, Nintendo. In fact, I, uh... My head, this pain, why won't this pain go away? I... Don't you dare ignore me, Nintendo. I demand the SDK, and if you do not obey, I will take my revenge. You miserable fools! I will run your pathetic company into the ground and spit on the smoldering remains. I will crush you into dust and flush away the ashes like any other filth. Rotting, putrid sewage. That's all you are. And again, this continues on to the next day. I really need to get out of here. This headache just won't go away. It's beginning to worry me. I'm starting to become paranoid that there's some kind of camera hidden in my room. I can't shake this feeling that I'm being watched. Ridiculous, I know. What am I thinking? Oh, about yesterday's post. I'm just getting around. I mean, look at what I said. It's obviously a joke. I wouldn't spit on the smoldering remains. That would put them out. And then it happened. Huge text reading. 100 day Tensai sit down protest fail. On Robert's 30th day of his 100th day protest, this text sits right above this image. It seems that Rob has given up on everything. This is the end of my 100 day protest to Nintendo. All I needed was for them to allow me to purchase a DVD with the software I need to finish. I really wanted to finish this game. The post goes into far more detail explaining how upset Robert is against Nintendo, or Gantendo as he puts it now, which is a play on words between the evil kingdom of Ganon and Nintendo, for those that didn't connect that, stating that this is the real Nintendo. One day later, although I can't actually find any actual picture evidence of this, but I did read about it on several now defunct blogs, again via the Wayback Machine, that he put up a note against his still live webcam saying that he was going to kill himself. This was quickly followed by a NeoGAF user finding the number of a relative who then contacted the police who showed up at his apartment where he simply said, It was a joke. And when you think it couldn't get any more stupider, Honestly, I don't really know what's going on now. It turns out that Rob is now back on with his 100 day challenge, but this time it's apparently not the same office, although obviously it looks exactly the same. But instead, he is now in a top secret underground fortress, which is aboard an alien spacecraft of some kind. Yep, Robert has been abducted. What's going on here? This senseless revenge makes absolutely no sense. I assure you, I am very serious. I'll see you there on day 100, Reggie. Oh yeah, I'm still waiting for that developer application decision so I can get that SDK. Just letting you know. No pressure, man. Guys, this has gone on long enough. I'm not going to continue going on one by one, reading these updates. It's hurting my head. I'm sure the clever among you will be able to go find the Wayback Machine page that has all of this still available. So in an attempt to speed things up, let me just give you the highlights. He slates Nintendo for rehashing old games like the original Pikmin for the Wii. He claims to have evidence against Nintendo that would completely crush them, which he will reveal within the next 20 days. He then claims that someone broke into his house, deleted his camera footage, keylogged his PC, and plenty of other things. This is not a joke. They are like the Japanese Mafia. They want to silence me. It's either them or the aliens. He then claims that it is in fact aliens, but calms readers' nerves by saying that he has convinced them to take him back to Earth so he can continue to take down the evil Gantendo. They've also increased my webcam bandwidth. Aliens are awesome. Thanks, aliens. And then, finally, Nintendo actually replied to him 25 weeks later with a very standard cut and paste response telling him that after reviewing his game that they will not be releasing it. 
This was on the 5th of February 2009, and whilst all was going on over at Bob'sGame.com a few days prior to this, he actually uploaded a video of himself attacking the official Nintendo World Store in New York, placing posters of his game on the walls, putting physical copies of his game on the shelves, and just pretty much just being a nuisance. And in an interview with MTV, Reggie even replied himself when questioned about Bob's game. He did submit to be a licensed developer. We have an evaluation process. We evaluated the opportunity. We decided at this point in time that he did not meet the requirements to be a licensed developer. Robert continued to moan about the company that he's beginning to hate on his website before uploading a very scripted, twisted version of his meeting with Mr. Prada, showing them off as a company that just don't care about their fans in the slightest back on his YouTube channel. And another video explaining very briefly what had happened up to this point before finally exposing Nintendo like he said he would. And how did he go about exposing them, I hear you ask? <laughs> well, are you ready for this? He claimed that they were all being controlled by the evil Miyamoto, releasing games that protected the bottom line and essentially brainwashing the public. Reggie was being controlled, his mind hopelessly weakened by an overload of Imagine's games. He had become corrupted, an evil double of the real Reggie. Even worse, it dawned on me, the man behind it all, that grinning figure in the shadows that rarely spoke. It was definitely him. Yes, Nintendo was being controlled by none other than Miyamoto. I knew then that it was up to me. I had to save the software kingdom. I had no choice. This was fate. For I held the only weapon with the power to defeat this evil. The greatest game ever made. Even armed with this legendary super game, I knew it wouldn't be easy. I was facing an army. The millions of brainwashed children. And if that isn't crazy enough, he finally announced one more thing. Hold on a second. Did you really not get it yet? I've been telling you from the very beginning. In fact, you have been playing it all along. Bob's game is not what you might think. There's a reason it's called that. Bob's game is a game about a game called Bob's Game. The bottom screen is Bob's Game. It's the story of a young independent developer named Bob who has created a game and struggles to get it published in a cold industry. He discovers a dark secret. The industry doesn't want new ideas. It's a carefully controlled business model and real innovation poses a threat. Of course, this is all just in the game. I'm sure it's not really like that. He finally announced that everything up to this point was a game, and you, the innocent viewer, have all been playing along. Bob's Game, a game about a guy who struggles to publish a game against the evil Gantendo. Yes, it was all a lie. Yep, everything up to this point was a lie. He showed footage of how he neatly destroyed his room and another video of him and his friends putting up posters and dropping business cards and then putting Bob's game onto, well, just a normal shelf, which he would then obviously splice into his trip at the Nintendo World Store. It was just a viral marketing ad, guys, that, well, as annoying as it is, you can't deny, back in the day, it definitely worked. Apart from the fact that it didn't because Nintendo don't want anything to do with him now. Oh, God. Anyway, shortly after all of this, the demo was eventually released, showcasing a young character called Yu growing up in a Nintendo-themed world of a company against him, <laughs> basically replicating everything I've just said to you. It was fairly well received by most people that played it, all apart from the angry people that just didn't like what he did up to this point, which is why it was rather odd to find that this was the last time that we actually heard of Bob for a good couple of years. Absolutely no advancements on the games at all. That was until mid-2011, where he showcased his plans to release his own handheld. This didn't get very far. He said it would cost about 25 quid, because apparently that's all they do cost to make. And again, after this, he buggered off for a bit until about 2014, where he started posting some crazily obscure videos on his YouTube channel of, um, well, him doing stuff like this. 
And this. And this. And this. Yep, that's just a video of his ceiling. And, yes, after all of this gumph, it's finally time to get to the Kickstarters. On the 25th of November 2013, Bob returned with a Kickstarter for a humble $6,607, which he didn't hit as only 37 backers got it to $477. Probably because, although it was called Bob's Game, it wasn't. Well, technically it is Bob, as in Rob's Game, and technically it is the game inside the game called Bob's Game, which is essentially a very warped Tetris-style block game, but it's not the original Bob's Game. <sighs> he even stated in the FAQ that this would not include the infamous Bob's Game that he'd been viral marketing up to this point. In his own words, It's the greatest game ever made. The legendary Bob's Game puzzle game from inside the Bob's Game RPG is coming to Ouya and PC. Like I already said, it failed big time, but on the 1st of January 2014, he actually finished it and you can download it yourself on Steam and the Ouya. That is if you're the only person in the world that's still got one of them plugged in. It's completely free, so you know, go try it out yourself. It's a pretty solid, definitely not the greatest game ever made, but still pretty good. The big twist is that the gameplay constantly changes on the fly throughout the game, making each experience completely different. In his mind, it's the greatest puzzle game ever, because it's every puzzle game ever. Well, obviously not really, but you get the delusional logic. Regardless, it's all pointless because, as good as the game eventually was when it was released in 2014, it's not the Bob's game that we want. It's a different Bob's game. We want this Bob's game, the original Bob's game. Well, thankfully, Bob came back on the 23rd of April 2014 asking for $10,000 this time to finish off the original Bob's game. <laughs> Seriously, he could have at least named them differently. Anyway, he hit his goal of 10,000 when 223 people pledged the combined total of $10,409 and he has never finished it. He applied to get the game on several platforms including Steam before Greenlight was a thing and was rejected constantly building up the impression that the games industry is brainwashing us all because, you know, that's the logical conclusion. He personally moved around to Texas and eventually Silicon Valley before running out of money and living in a friend's house and eventually an overextended stay at a scary motel as he puts it before his parents paid his rent for him for six months in the cheapest place he could find before they got fed up with him, stopped paying his rent which resulted in him driving across the country back to Michigan to live with them before he had another argument, stormed out and drove back leaving all of his stuff behind, slept in his car for another nine months and that is what this Kickstarter is truly amount. It's not about finishing Bob's game. For only 10k, he plans to get a cheap hack van, as he puts it, and live in it so that he can finish the game in peace. The truth of it is he quickly realized that he needed something more than a van, and he used the money to get a place to stay in instead, and as you no doubt guess, that's why the game isn't finished. He went back to living in his car for another six months, and that was in January of 2016. In February of 2017, he gave another tiny update regarding the release of the puzzle game, which we've already reviewed, and that's it. There was an article on Forbes about a year before this that claimed that Bob was going to reimburse all of his backers and release the source code in its unfinished state because apparently he's given up on that game that he spent a heavy amount of his life working on. But he denied this. However, like I said, the game isn't finished. It's been a good couple of years since we've had any kind of an update on the original game. And yes, that source code for the puzzle game at least was indeed uploaded to GitHub in August of 2016. And guys, that is it. My God. What a roller coaster ride. The innocent story of an earthbound clone painstakingly created by an avid Nintendo fan over five years before he tried to show the world how evil Nintendo are because, you know, they wouldn't publish his game. He went crazy, put himself under house arrest, admitted the whole thing was fake, created two Kickstarters, lost all his money, and to the best of our knowledge, still lives in his car so that he could eventually, well, never actually release Bob's game. No, not that Bob's game, this Bob's game, for f**k's sake.
Jesus is God. I am the next Messiah, the true successor to Jesus Christ, the greatest and most historically significant human that will ever live, and the most powerful wizard of all time. I don't need the game anymore. Games don't matter. It's wrong to make money by creating distractions for others. Money doesn't matter at all. It's the process of developing yourself that's important. Magic is real. Having a pure soul is the only thing that really does matter. I will release some things for free in the source code under GPL. Bob's game cannot be stopped. Oh, shut up, Bob. Go home, you're drunk. <laughs>